You mentioned neural decoder. How much machine learning is in, in the decoder? How much magic, how much science, how much art? How difficult is it to come up with a decoder that figures out what these uh, sequence of spikes mean? Yeah, good question. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to answer this. So maybe I'll zoom out briefly first and then I'll go down one of the rabbit holes. So the zoomed out view is that building the decoder is really the process of building the data set plus compiling it into the weights. And uh, each of those steps is important. Uh, the direction I think of further improvement is primarily going to be in the data set side of how do you construct the optimal labels for the model. But there's an entirely separate challenge of then how do you compile the best model? And so I'll go briefly down the second one, down the second rabbit hole. One of the main challenges with designing the optimal model for BCI is that offline metrics don't necessarily correspond to online metrics. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's fundamentally a control problem. The user is trying to control something on the screen. And the exact sort of user experience of how you output the intention uh, impacts your ability to control. So for example, if you just look at validation loss as predicted by your model, there can be multiple ways to achieve the same validation loss. Not all of them are equally controllable by the end user. And so the you know, it might be as simple as saying, oh, you could just add auxiliary loss terms that like help you capture the thing that actually matters. But this is a very complex, nuanced process. So how you turn the labels into the model is uh, more of a nuanced process than just like a standard supervised learning problem. One very fascinating uh, anecdote here, we've tried many different sort of neural network architectures that translate brain data to uh, velocity outputs, for example. And one uh, example that's stuck in my brain from a couple years ago now uh, is we pre at one point we were using just fully connected networks to decode the brain activity. We tried a uh, A-B test where we were measuring uh, the relative performance in online control sessions of uh, sort of 1D convolution over the input signal. So if you imagine per channel, you have a sliding window that's producing some uh, convolved feature for each of those input sequences for every single channel simultaneously, you can actually get better validation metrics, meaning you're fitting the data better and it's generalizing better in offline data if you use this convolutional architecture. You're reducing parameters, it's sort of a standard uh, uh, standard procedure when you're dealing with time series data. Now it turns out that when using that model online, the controllability was was worse, it was far worse, even though the offline metrics were mm -hmm. better. And uh, there can be many ways to interpret that, but what that taught me at least was that, hey, it's at least the case right now that if you were to just throw a bunch of compute at this problem and you were trying to sort of hyperparameter optimize or you know let some GPT model hard code or come up with or invent many different solutions, if you were just optimizing for loss, it would not be sufficient, which means that there's still some inherent modeling gap here. There's still some artistry left to be uncovered here of how to get your model to scale with more compute. And that may be fundamentally a labeling problem, but there may be other components to this as well. Is it uh, data constraint at this time? Like, do, which is what it sounds like. Like, how do you get a lot of good labels? Yeah, I think it's data quality constrained, not necessarily data quantity constrained. But even like, even just the quantity, I mean, because it has to be trained on the, on the interactions. I guess there's not that many interactions. Yeah, so it depends what version of this you're talking about. So if you're talking about like, let's say the simplest example of just 2D velocity, then I think, yeah, data quality is the main thing. If you're talking about how to build a sort of multifunction output that lets you do all the inputs to the computer that you and I can do, then it's actually a much more sophisticated nuanced modeling challenge because now you need to think about not just when the user's left clicking, but when you're building the left click model, you also need to be thinking about how to make sure it doesn't fire when they're trying to right click or when they're trying to move the mouse. So one example of an interesting bug from like sort of week one of uh, a PCI with Noland was when he moved the mouse, uh, the click signal sort of dropped off a cliff and when he stopped, the click signal went up. So again, there's a contamination between the, the, two, the two inputs. Another good example was at one point he was trying to do uh, sort of a left click and drag. Mm -hmm. And the minute he started moving, the left click signal dropped off a cliff. So again, because there's some contamination between the two signals, you, you need to come up with some way to either in the data set or in the model, build robustness against this kind of, uh, you think of it like overfitting, but really it's just that the model has not seen this kind of variability before. So you need to find some way to help the model with that. This is super cool. Because th it feels like all of this is very solvable, but mm -hmm. it's hard. Yes, it is fundamentally an engineering challenge. This is important to emphasize. And it's also important to emphasize that it may not need fundamentally new techniques, which means that you know people who work on, let's say, unsupervised speech classification using CTC loss, for example, with internal to Siri, they could potentially have very applicable skills to this.